Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. I'm Jessica Matthews, president of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, and it's my pleasure to welcome you here today. After nearly 20 months of increasing brutality by President Bashar al-Assad and his security forces, more than 35,000 deaths and millions of refugees, it's hard to even remember that this conflict began with a determinedly peaceful opposition. Not only has it become increasingly violent, but the longer the fighting has gone on, the more the ugly specter of sectarianism has clouded the conflict, and the arrival of outside fighters has threatened to, to steal the true narrative of this revolution. Deep divisions within the opposition factions and within the international community have complicated and exacerbated the situation and have confounded the search uh, for effective international action. We know that the greatest challenges lie ahead. We know from experience around the world and most recently from Tunisia and Egypt that post-authoritarian transitions are difficult under the best of circumstances, and in cases burdened by civil war, by sectarian division, and by the involvement of outside parties, the odds against success lengthen dramatically. The Carnegie Middle East program has convened this conference to consider some of the key issues that will be at the center of any transition the means to achieve a political settlement between the key groups in the country, the socioeconomic challenges that Syria will face in the months and years ahead, and the role of political Islam in any Syrian state. The stakes for Syria, for the region, and for the entire world could not be higher. Left unresolved, this conflict threatens to destabilize an already volatile region, to unravel the fragile balance in Lebanon and in Iraq, to undermine the security of a neighboring NATO ally, and to provide fertile ground for extremists to thrive. Ultimately, the process of change must be Syrian-led if it is to enjoy legitimacy. But the US, all of us in this room, and the entire international community have a profound interest in how this conflict and whether this conflict is resolved. We must all think deeply about what the international community can and should do to help. The work to bring us here today began five months ago, and it has not been an easy task, as many of you know personally. In many ways, some of the challenges that have faced policymakers working on Syria have plagued this conference as well. Despite tireless efforts and close coordination with the US Department of State, a number of obstacles were thrown in the way of gathering the key players together. Over the last 48 hours, several expected visas have been held up. Um, and have fallen afoul of the Department of Homeland Security processes as participants ready to actually board their flights. Some key participants from the Syrian National Council were held up at the last minute and did not board their planes yesterday from Doha because of the rescheduled SNC meeting, which did not complete its business as planned. I'm pleased to say that we have been able to work around many of these challenges, and we have a top-notch group of participants for you today. Several managed to find their way to Washington as planned, and we've been able to arrange for last-minute video conferencing from three different locations to enable other panelists to join us in these discussions. I want to thank first Catherine Wilkins uh, for her role in organizing this event. Without her vision, her perseverance, and tireless efforts in the face of really enormous odds, we wouldn't be here. Omar Hasino and Tiffany Tupper also deserve special recognition for going well beyond the call of duty and working around the problems. And I want to thank Mukhtar Awad for all his help as well. I want to express our gratitude 
uh, to today's panelists for joining us at this very busy moment and this crucial moment. Um, many of them have endured enormous, enormous frustrations in, in getting here. Uh, we recognize that and, um, and we apologize for it. I want to also add my thanks to all of you for being here. Uh, no conference is better than its participants, and as I look around the room, I'm confident that for this important meeting uh, is already, in this respect, a success. With that said, let me turn the microphone over to Marwan Mwasher, the head of Carnegie's Middle East program, who will be chairing today's first panel. Marwan. Thank you very much, Jessica. Good morning to all of you. Uh, before we start uh, the first panel, let me just uh, take care of some uh, administrative issues. I want to remind everybody to have their cell phones off, please. We also have a video conference connection, and uh, it's very important that your cell phones are off. I also want to uh, tell people that we have uh, translation for today's event, the full uh, events. English will be on channel 8 and Arabic on channel 9. Uh, at the end of uh, the presentations, we're going to, uh, of course, open the floor for questions. We have uh, our junior fellows and interns ready to uh, come to you with a microphone. If you just uh, uh, please raise your hand ask questions. We have a lot of people today, so I would urge you to uh, keep your comments to a minimum and ask a question rather than make statements. With that, uh, we will uh, start the first panel, which is about elements of a political settlement in Syria. 20 months after the start of the uprising, the opposition in Syria appears to be as disorganized and divided as ever. This has been an elusive uh, goal to unite the opposition and one that has played an important role in Western decision making uh, on Syria. And so one of the key questions we would like to uh, ask the panelists is, what is the key obstacle to greater unity among the opposition? Is it personal ambition? Is it ideological differences? Is it support by outside countries? What was the reason for the failure of the opposition to unite earlier this year at the Cairo conference? And most importantly now, to what extent are the meetings that are happening you know, this week, including today in Doha, likely to advance the goal of greater unity and diversity in the opposition? Where do we go from here? Uh, can the elements of a political settlement be put together? Uh, uh, Syria has been different from other models uh, in the region, such as Tunisia and Egypt, because of the sectarian nature of the conflict and the presence of three significant minority groups, Alawites, Kurds, and Christians. Given all this, is it likely uh, that a national political settlement to end the conflict and move the country into a new phase, uh, is, it, is it likely? When would that happen? Over what time frame? And at what point will this become a viable option? Uh, a lot of questions uh, that, uh, uh, that uh, you know, I and, and all of you, I'm sure, have for the panelists. We have a panel of really top-notch uh, activists and experts on the issue to help us and guide us through all these questions. Dr. Basma Kadmani, on my right, is a political scientist, academic, and director of the Arab Reform Initiative in Paris, a Syrian, of course, national. She is the ex-spokesperson of the SNC, <clears throat> and uh, only until recently has been a very uh, active member of the SNC leadership. And to my immediate uh, left is uh, Dr. Alan Simo, who is uh, a member of the Kurdish Democratic Union Party in Syria. Uh, as well as a member of the National Coordination Body, Hayat al Tansiq al Watani. He's also the head of the Foreign Affairs Committee of the Kurdish Democratic Union 
based in London and a professor at the School of Oriental and African Studies in the University of London. And uh, joining us uh, via VC from Brussels is uh, Dr. Bassam Hatahit, a member of the Syrian Muslim Brotherhood and also the Syrian National Council. He's a dentist by training and uh, lives in Belgium and has worked with the Muslim Brotherhood in exile uh, for a number of years. Uh, <clears throat> so I'd like to welcome the panels. And uh, the way we're going to do this is I will ask maybe a number of questions just to open up the discussion uh, for each of the panelists and hope that uh, you can answer these and any other questions uh, that you would like. A lot of, to Basma, uh, let's, let, let's start with Basma, who is also on the advisory board, I should say, of Carnegie uh, Middle East program and has been uh, a very active uh, 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 contributor to the program here. Basma, much of the focus has been on the external opposition, but what is the status of the internal opposition today in Syria? Are there chances for a peaceful, inclusive movement uh, inside uh, uh, the country and <clears throat> what has happened to these secular nonviolent movements on the ground in Syria which we have seen before but might have been overtaken by uh, a sort of violence in uh, recent months. Do you see them playing a role in any future political settlement uh, uh, in the country uh, and what has uh, finally been your own personal experience with the SNC and uh, uh, with moving forward. So, Basma, the floor is yours. Thank you, Marwan. I'm really very happy to be here. Thank you to the whole team at Carnegie. It's a big pleasure to be back at the uh, in a place where we can have a candid and open discussion. Uh, and I am in no official position or formal position in the opposition to uh, uh, to be uh, in uh, to, to to be inhibited about anything I would like to say. Uh, I still belong to the Syrian opposition, definitely, uh, or I should say, to the Syrian revolution. And the distinction here, I think, is important, and that might bring a first answer to one of your questions, Marwan. Uh, I think we have a revolution, a true revolution, that is changing society, changing uh, relationships between groups on the ground, uh, between social groups on the ground, between different regions of the country, between the capital and the other uh, provinces. Uh, there is a deep uh, movement that is changing Syria. Uh, and then there is an opposition. And this opposition is uh, weak. It grew under authoritarianism. And I think maybe one subject for research one day would be, uh, I think of Marina Ottaway who conducted her work on semi-authoritarianism. This is full authoritarianism. Uh, what do politics look like under authoritarianism? Uh, and what we are now experiencing is how uh, individuals uh, with some ideological background that has never faced uh, practical challenges, uh, that has never had to behave in a responsible way because it never was in a situation to develop a strategy to reach power, etc., or to build coalitions, and so on. This is the state of the opposition. But the revolution on the ground is something different. Um, what we see today, of course, is that we've had for a good, an, almost a year, um, peaceful movements peaceful demonstrations, peaceful strategies of organizing society to resist. The whole Syrian society entered into resistance uh, in the first year. And then emerged the need to defend oneself in face of a regime that pushed very hard to attract the uh, peaceful demonstrations, the peaceful revolt, uh, towards a mili the military, into the military field, because this is where it has the upper hand. Uh, 
the decision to arm the revolution was no, nobody's decision. It was a spontaneous uh, development to a very large extent. Some groups understood earlier than others that it would only happen with arms, that uh, it was inevitable at some point uh, to pick that people uh, carry arms and uh, face the regime because the alternative is to go back home and going back home is not going back home, is going into an even harsher prison for the whole society. So what happened on the ground is these movements that were peaceful picked up arms. So when we say the Free Syrian Army, we speak of a population in arms. And it is ex almost impossible to really build a, a map of all these groups on the ground. There are th thousands, tens of thousands of small groups that organize themselves on their own, uh, rarely uh, into big units, uh, and that now uh, represent the reality of Syria across the country. These groups, at the moment the re re revolt became uh, militarized, the whole revolution became dependent on outside support. And I think this is where uh, Syria lost its uh, uh, independence in the sense that this was not anymore uh, a movement of one society against its regime. Uh, the regime resorted to outside support and receives it uh, very generously. Uh, and the population, the moment it needed arms and money, uh, had to resort also to outside support. And I would put it in this way for those who have no agenda of their own. Yes, you can say some countries are fighting an, a battle of their own on Syrian ground. Yes, we can say that some have an agenda uh, for Syria. But if we speak of those peaceful demonstrators who picked up arms, they are. They were at. Uh, they they became dependent on outside support, and I and this is what began to change the nat not the nature but the inclination of this revolution, because the support comes from Islamic conservative countries. We saw the uh, a stronger and stronger uh, trend of uh, Islamic uh, groups. Uh, developing on the ground. Uh, definitely the lack of international, uh, of an effective management of the situation in Syria uh, also pushed people to say we have to depend on ourselves, uh, there is no outside support and therefore uh, we have to uh, resort to uh, the courage that God gives us. I think there was, this is a very important element of why uh, the uh, Muslim discourse gains ground in Syria, why it becomes more popular. But if I were to say, is this an, has it become an Islamic revolution? I would say it's an Islamic funded revolution to a large extent, to a very large extent, because there are no alternative sources of financial support and military support, uh, but this is definitely not an Islamic revolution. Uh, and groups are dependent on support, but that does not tell us at all what the political thinking is on the ground. The militarization happened to a large extent and then came back a civilian um, factor or a civilian phenomenon, and that's the emergence of local councils. Uh, it is a very interesting and promising development. These local councils, because the whole revolution is organized at the local level, that is the only way it can organize itself to face the regime, uh, those local, this local organization became more and more formal, and we have now local councils in many places in very many places, actually in every province of Syria, that are more or less organized with committees that are uh, legal, uh, humanitarian, uh, media, and uh, 
medical as well as military, of course, but the, com the civilian component is extremely important. It replaces the services of the regime. The regime is not there anymore, does not provide any services, and the local councils have grown into real uh, entities that are trying to develop democratic, democratic mechanisms to have representation, and they are in the process of aggregating uh, their uh, different units to uh, develop representation at the level of each governorate in Syria, and there are 14 of those. If that process continues as it has developed in a very promising way, I think we begin to have maybe an opposition on the ground that we can speak of, <coughs> but that will remain dependent on financial support. Uh, as you know, there may be 10 million Syrians now who are dependent on uh, humanitarian aid because of the loss of, of any resources. And that makes Syria entirely really dependent on, thank you, dependent on what comes from outside. And if I can say in a few words what the opposition, how the opposition can succeed in uniting its forces now, it is probably by getting <coughs> getting the commitment. First of all, by having, of course, representation of inside and outside, but more importantly, the commitment that financial support will be channeled through a political authority that has uh, credible representation. And only in this case can we unite forces on the ground and the opposition outside will come together. Uh, and I'm... Uh, I'm describing something that is the other way round to that to what is required from the opposition. That is, the opposition is required to unite uh, the Free Syrian Army to come together to have a unified command before it can get the support it needs. And the message is: look at it the other way round. If if you prov the financial support and the humanitarian support and the military support is what will unite groups on the ground. And therefore, there's a the very important role to the international community here to decide that this is what it wants. And I think this will uh, bring the parties to, uh, sp not spontaneously, but out of need, to come together uh, and, and work together. For the moment, Support comes from different directions to different groups. If that ends, we will unite the political groups. But the political groups and the military groups will not do it on their own if the financial support come, continues to come in from different directions and to different uh, groups uh, on the ground. That's a first answer. Maybe yeah. I don't want to be too long. And no, that, the, to... Thank you, Basma. We're going to have a discussion about all these uh, issues. So thank you for, uh, for all these clarifications. I'd like to uh, move uh, to Dr. Bassam Hatahat in Brussels. And uh, I, I will ask the questions uh, in Arabic to Dr. Bassam. He will also answer in Arabic. But you have, as I said, instantaneous translations. Uh, uh, with you, uh, so if you bear with us, uh, Dr. Bassam. Uh, Dr. Bassam, good evening to you, sir. You have heard Dr. Bassma and uh, what she said about the internal opposition, and also uh, about what she said about the Islamization, uh, uh, at least not the Islamization of the revolution, but the sources of financing of the revolution. Many believe, including the United States, that the Muslim Brotherhood uh, did not succeed in reassuring the Syrian minorities, the Kurds, the Alawites, the Christians, uh, did not succeed in giving them uh, their assurances uh, to participate uh, better in the revolution, particularly with the Iraqi experience in that regard. How do you respond to that? What? Uh, did the Muslim Brotherhood do in order to attempt to gather the different minorities in Syria? The other question is, which is being presented strongly here and in other international quarters, is there any attempt to uh, uh, downsize the uh, role of the Salafis and the other radical groups that have started appearing
thing in Syria and the other scenes that we see on television screens, which of course the Syrian regime, which is brutal, uh, but also we started seeing uh, practices uh, from the Salafis and the radical groups. Uh, are there any attempts to uh, downsize this? Is uh, roles by the Muslim Brotherhood from uh, 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 downsize the role of these people? Uh, uh, what is your vision for Syria after the revolution? Are you with a civil, uh, uh, pluralistic uh, 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 civilian uh, regime? Are you with a uh, peaceful? Uh, uh, deli uh, uh, deliberations and uh, uh, authority in uh, Syria, with all these issues that have been presented to Islamists in the Arab uh, uh, world. Doctor, please. Firstly, uh, thank you uh, and uh, my greetings to everybody, especially Dr. Basma. Thank you very much uh, for this, uh, because this meeting, whether it, it is from uh, the intervention of uh, Ms. Basma or other people, uh, is very important. Let me say a few uh, words about the situation in Syria. The Syrian regime was able uh, to uh, forcefully fragment uh, the Syrian social contract. Uh, uh, we had uh, good experiences in the 50s. The Syrian people then had a real social contract. The prime minister was a Christian. Uh, we had the Kurds and uh, other uh, in the cabinet. There was no differences in the different factions of Syria. When this regime uh, took power, uh, they were able to fragment this social contract. Uh, whether we uh, are seen a bro uh, brotherhood, a Muslim brotherhood, or a whole uh, Syrian people, we have to regain that uh, social contract because otherwise we'll have many problems and uh, we. We should return to a Syrian state uh, that belongs to all the Syrian people, to be under the umbrella that gathers all the uh, minorities and different factions under this umbrella of uh, uh, nationalism. The other point is that we in Syria now, as uh, Dr. Basma said, uh, this revolution was spontaneous. and. Uh, immediately became military, uh, military movement, not because they like militarism, but because the Syrian regime pushed them very strongly in that direction. Uh, <laughs> the, any regime uh, that loves uh, uh, their people would not throw uh, uh, bombs and uh, chemical weapons against their own people. Uh, that have uh, war, uh, uh, were uh, under this uh, brutality for 40 years. Uh, so the regime had really uh, led to the militarization of the revolution until the six and seven uh, uh, month of this uh, movement, we were against uh, the Islamization of this uh, revolution. Therefore, uh, the revolution uh, was uh, included all segments of the po population. You, you, you asked about the reassurances to the uh, minorities. We'll give you three main facts. Uh, firstly, we, in, we are directly cooperating with other, uh, other groups such as Christians we, and other groups. So we work with them. We meet with them in the Syrian National Council. We talk with them within the civil society groups. Uh, we, uh, we, we, we exchange all kinds of food. More so, moreover, there we, we had uh, great uh, uh, discussions with the Syrian Christian, uh, Assyrian uh, Christian uh, groups, uh, and also uh, the, this union is represented in the Syrian National Council. This Assyrian Council uh, was working somewhat with the Syrian regime, but through our discussions with them and meetings with them, now they are part of the, the National Council. Uh, so we have even many meetings with non-Syrians on the uh, Christian issues. Uh, 
we have lots of meetings uh, with our meeting uh, with our friends in Europe. Uh, we talk a lot about Syria and the future of Syria. We do not talk in any one given day as Muslim Brothers or a Muslim uh, movement. Uh, we want a civil state uh, that will emanate from a civilian constitution 100%. Uh, so uh, is Islam uh, came, it would come with a civilian uh, society. If we talked about uh, Omar al-Khattab, uh, he was the first uh, to introduce a civilian uh, so, uh, nation. Uh, he talked about uh, all kinds of civilian things. Uh, uh, the state that we want is uh, is a civilian sense. Now we are talking about the 21 points uh, that we want a state that would uh, represent the Syrian citizenship with all their factions. Can you blow it down? It's too loud. It's too loud. Can we? But uh, the uh, revolution uh, dimensions all, we are reassured the rest, uh, whether they are Kurds or Christians or our regional uh, neighbors uh, or our uh, neighbors in the world. Uh, this is a secular, 100% secular state that we aspire for. We just wanted to overthrow Bashar al-Assad. <sighs> We want a state of justice and freedom and equality as to the radicals and the Salafis. Dr. Bassam, thank you very much. Uh, about uh, Specifically, I want to ask about the Alawites. Do you have any contacts with the Alawites, please? You talked about contacts with some of the Christian denominations, but uh, Alawis in particular, per, uh, also perhaps Kurds. Uh, but now we want to talk about that. When we speak about the Alawites, uh, actually, the Alawites are uh, uh, deeply rooted in the. Uh, power in Syria and they are contacting the Muslim brothers for six or seven months after the dissension they have been trying to contact them. We are always having uh, contacts between, with the Alawites because before that there are certain dissidents who have been Alawites, but they descended either in the army or in the civil society organization. We are not against the Alawites by all means, but if we are talking about the citizenship for every person, that every Syrian citizen is going to enjoy all the rights of being a citizen in Syria. What's going on now for the sake of liberation is not going on. Therefore, if there is kind of reconciliation between the different sects of Syria, either by the Alawites or non-Alawites, there should be a, a, a fair uh, court in order that it can interfere in that. We have had many meetings with Kurdish uh, political parties in all other parts of the country, and we have been talking about the procedures that are going to take place shortly and is going to have an impact on what's going on right now. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bassam. Uh, uh, to ask a bit about uh, what is happening with the Kurdish uh, uh, minority in Syria. Uh, the conflict, of course, has drawn uh, new attention to the Kurdish issue, not just in Syria, but in neighboring countries, in particularly in Turkey and, and Iraq as well. Uh, I'd like to ask you, what are the goals of the Syrian Kurds and the PYD uh, in particular? Why has the PYD refused to coordinate with the opposition and work with the Free Syrian Army on the ground, for example. Do you believe that the Kurds are stronger by standing on their own rather than engaging more directly with other opposition groups? What role do you think Turkey is playing in the opposition? And do you see that role as against 
Kurdish interests in Syria? And finally, can you imagine a situation where the Kurds of Syria achieve some form of autonomy or self-governance within a unified Syrian state and uh, agree not to be involved in the struggle, let's say, for greater freedom of Kurds in neighboring countries? All these uh, are questions that I will pose to you and the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Moran, and I'm very pleased, I'm delighted to be here um, to highlight the, the demand on the role of the Syrian Kurds, uh, particularly. Well, um, the Syrian, just make it briefly, uh, uh, the fact about the Syrian Kurds. Uh, they have been uh, actively uh, contributing to liberate the Syrian from the French mandate, and since uh, the Ba'ath Party 1963, the coup of March, take over and sweep power, and um, implemented a discriminatory and uh, a denial politic of the Kurds. So one of them is uh, the exceptional census, where where 120 then 120 thousand Kurds have been stripped of their Syrian nationality and deprived of their human, basic human rights. So the Kurds in Syria still now, they cannot get married, register themselves. They can, don't register their, they are not allowed to register their children in school. So, and they, they cannot come to any hotel, to book a hotel because they don't have any Syrian nationality. And now we're talking about about half Syrian Kurds buried alive, which was one of the documented documented talks happening into the Syrian Kurds. And the second uh, policy, discriminatory policy, was the uh, the Arab Belt, where uh, the Arab uh, settlers coming to the Kurdish area and set to in order to. Uh, assimilate and Arabazai uh, the, the country the, of the Kurds. So the Kurds have been Syrian in the part of the Syrian revolution and they actively contributed. And since the uh, pro-democracy uprising, the Kurds clearly supported the popular uprising for democracy and dignity. This is our clear position including PYD and all the Kurdish uh, parties and movement. The first two weeks of the pro-democracy uprising, the PYD and the Kurdish people declared their position. We are with the Syrian people in our identity for democracy and a dignity against the corruption, dictatorship, and political repression. This was the clear stand of the Kurds in Syria. And this was, was the cooperating with the Syrian and they have approached the Syrian, I call it Syrian opposition. Right, after, I do agree with my colleague, after seven months of a peaceful protest and demonstration, the Syrian people proved they can change. They can struggle and resist against this brutal regime with all component of the Syrian. As a two mechanism factor that played a role to fail the opposition and make this brutal regime more brutal, to kill and massacre its own people. The first, the first fact was that the opposition of the Syrian did not adapt, did not adapt the demand of the peaceful people, the Syrian people. They didn't demand, they didn't adopt the demand, and they didn't lead it. And the second point was the regional and international or global 
power players intervened. And unfortunately and sadly, turned the peaceful pro-democracy and dignity revolution into a civil sectarian war. This is unfortunate and sadly to say that after seven months. So the Syrian, yeah, the Syrian revolution, the Syrian uprising for democracy and dignity turned to a sectarian violence. We're talking about the war today. And the Syrian people, all Syrian people demands for legitimate democracy and dignity have been trapped in between two this violent war, proxy war, I call it, and behalf of, right, trapped this, we Syrian people, unfortunately, we trapped in between these two proxy war. One proxy war supported to seeking for a change of the seat of the power. Nobody talking about democracy in Syria. Not to, nobody talking about the revolution, the revolution of institution of Syria, the change of the mentality. They get women and children and youth to change the society for democracy. They're talking about toppling Assad, over toppling Assad, Shiite Assad. And this position make it that one position that the, the revolution had been supported by, right, as my colleague mentioned that, I'm talking transparently and clear. This proxy war was on behalf of Gulf state, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, Turkey, Western power, and another proxy power on behalf of the brutal regime, Iran, Russia. And we Syrian people, unfortunately and sadly, trapped in this violent war. We are the victim. We paying the price for Saudi Arabia because they wanted to have a Sunni Arab. Or the view for the Turkey because they wanted to have a, a AKP or yeah, Muslims, political Islams in Syria. For the UK and the Western dominant power, a friendly Western who can promote the interests of the uh, Western interest. So in that position, the Kurds have been organizing themselves. And once the regime, since the regime, the brutal regime, lost the control and legitimacy by killing young people and legitimacy, the northern or the freight area of the Kurds in Syria have been limited and they're withdrawn because they wanted to concentrate and focusing on Aleppo battle. And then the Kurdish people, the Kurdish political parties, PYDA, KNC, the Kurdish National Council, cooperated together and took the control of the Kurdish area. And today, they get an agreement in uh, Hawler in Erbil with the KRG uh, in, in support of the KRG, they get it the Kurdish Supreme Court. And today, the Kurdish Supreme Court and all the Kurdish movement running their region peacefully, democratically, and the, their stand is clear. The Kurds are an, or other ethnic minorities. I can't talk about the Kurds. And I consider all the ethnic minorities in Syria, they are not neutral. They are with this pro-democracy uprising. We are not pro-Assad, pro-Iran, pro-Turkey. But unfortunately, today war is a proxy war. And we wanted to keep away from this violence because this violence is not benefiting and not promoting the Syrian national interest. This is the question. 
if today the FSA saying and fighting against this regime for a democracy, for a plural democratic Syria, I will one of the first who join them. But I wouldn't join them just to throw a lot of people from four and seven step just because saying Allahu Akbar to throw a lot of people from four step to the street. This is a clear, this is a clear position for the changing of all this democracy. And therefore, we thinking and we considering now as, as uh, uh, Syrian national coordinations body as well. We are part of it and PYD is the vice president of the movement. We're talking about the internal and I was surprised yesterday I had some chat with colleague. Nobody talking and nobody know about this internal movement which have a three position from start of the revolution and pro-democracy. Known to violence, known to military intervention, and no to sectarian war. This is a coordination, Syrian national coordination body uh, led by Hassan Abdul Azim and Haysam Manna in exile. And within that, this is the model for them that the Kurds have been managing themselves democratically. And this is a model for a united Syria. We are Kurd. This establishment is a threat to any regional and global powers. We consider this uh, peaceful establishment is a contributor and as a model for a future Syria where, where the people, all the Syrian people within the ethnic minority, they can rule themselves regionally. They can govern themselves regionally. This is our uh, vision in the future and kind of reform for the position in the Syria, we think about the future of the Syria. And this is the main option or the main opposition failed because we cannot agree. We are here talking about war and therefore I'm here, I'm talking about a reconciliation and peace plan. Right, we're not talking about Syrian revolution, unfortunately, we're talking about war, this sectarian war, and here we are here. And I think the Syrian opposition are united. I don't agree that they are divided and weak and we are united, but we have a different mechanism, which is a democratic view. We have a different mechanism. One mechanism is by military, we can topple this regime, and another one by peaceful demonstration and by civic movement. That's a different. And the problem is we cannot agree about on the common interest for the Syrian. This is the main issue. And we Kurds in Syria, we are not just to prove that we are Syrian. We are not leaving Syria. We are Syrian. We fight for Syria, liberation Syria. Yusuf al-Azma, the commander of the Syrian against the French, he was Kurd. Ibrahim Hanano was Kurd. We liberated Syria. We are Syrian. We don't, yeah. Not for disrespect any Syrians, they are the Kurds, they are separate, uh, separatists and they wanted to have as their own country. No, we are Syrian. We sacrificed for this country. We're living here, we have been living here. But we want to have a justice. Not for all. We don't want to have a self-democracy only for the Kurds. And this is our view for the future Syria. Within the geopolitic united Syria where we learn and get the experience from the Swiss model of country, United Kingdom, right, Welsh, Scotland, Northern Ireland, and your policy here of United States and the federal system. And we think 
and we could believe that the Kurds are integral a force or integral people in the Syrian in the Syrian United Syrian. So we wanted to have a self or democratic self governing where same as Scottish people, they, they got their parliament, they get their money, they get their language, they get that uni, right, which differ slightly from England or from Welsh. Why we cannot have uh, a, a, a small example of parliamentarian in Druze or Alawit or Syrian? So this is our point. We want to be integrated within the Syrian, United Syria. Yeah, we have been living together. We're going to live together. And this is the fact we wanted all the Syrian people, yeah, to get freely and democratically governing themselves within this United Syria. This is the position of the Kurds and the position of the democratic movement for democratic change and the peaceful change. So the view of, of all that, we are with the Kurds and the, this democratic movement, we are willing and we respecting the international legitimacy. And I stress that we talking about peace plan and unfortunately we missed one plan which was the peace plan of Kofi Annan and Geneva uh, declarations or resolutions. So it was comprehensive and uh, comprehensive peace plan and because of the insisting of the brutal regime to killing the people, it will not be realized. And not get enough support of the opposition. And unfortunately, we're looking forward that we can, as a Syrian, and I totally agree, how we can do this? Yes, very easy, very easy. These people who is proxy war, they are dependent people. They are not independent. They're dependent on Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Turkey, because they're financing them and they're sending them weapon. So the first step we can do it to, okay, sorry, to, to do this one here, cut off this regional and global intervention and then we as a Syrian people can sit down we can do it as you did your people in UK uh, in US four years ago you said we can make it you did it we could do it we can fight we are able to resist not just Assad hundreds of Assads brutal regimes because if we change it, we change it ourselves. Because if Saudi Arabia or Turkey wanted to change us, so they wanted to have their interests. And Turkey gets two interests there, is anti-Kurds, phobia, and the second thing, they don't want to have any establishment of the Kurd, and the second thing, the Islam politic of AKP. They wanted to have a Muslim, as my colleague mentioned, a Muslim government, not a Muslim country, he said. So what is different between Muslim country and Muslim government, right? So, so this is the two main thing. And this one, if we cut off the intervention by Turkey, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, who is promoting this war, we can manage ourselves. Look, this is example. The Kurds proved this. They don't get weapons from Turkey, do they? They don't get the weapon from US, do they? But they're managing themselves. And the Kurdish region now in Syria have been a, a safe haven. Half of the uh, Aleppo people, population, living in the Kurdish area. And this is why we, we stated, we said, this can be the safe haven. And we can start from Kamishli, Kubani, and Afrin to liberate all Syria. 
This is our view. And this is we called the, the opposition and political party in Syria. Right, we did this one here. Let's go move to Hama, Homs, Dara, Latqia, and liberate all these cities from this brutal regime. Sorry. So, yeah, conclusion here. Um, I'm sorry to draw this, this just bullet point just for that. So, uh, I think I make it clear, but I would love to hear your opinion and Wait. have a discussion. Thank, about it. thank you very much, uh, Dr. Allen. Let me uh, pose a question maybe to the panelists before we open it up for questions. I mean, there is a disconnect here. We hear a commitment to a democratic state in Syria from the Muslim Brotherhood, from the Kurds, from the different uh, groups. And yet on the ground, that's not happening. People are not talking about a political settlement on the ground. What we are seeing on the ground is increasing sectarian violence, increasing, you know, we all, all the opposition, of course, is united against uh, the regime of Bashar Assad, and everybody agrees that there is no future for Syria with Bashar Assad. But what is the, can, has the opposition put forward a clear plan for what they are for? Are they really for a democratic, uh, 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 pluralistic Syria? Indeed, not just in, in, in uh, you know, in words. And if they are, why have the different minorities as well as the Sunni majority in Syria, why have they not been able to come together and put forward uh, a political plan that is clear, that is uh, that all the sides can subscribe to, and that would have the international community have an easier task in supporting the opposition uh, if they see that they are at least united in a plan, then, then, then you know no opposition will be united on all issues. But why has this uh, not taken place? Is it premature to talk about a political settlement? Is the situation on the ground such that all efforts now are uh, focused on toppling the regime of Bashar al-Assad? And if it is premature, is there not a risk that the sectarian violence will reach a level such that when the regime falls, elements of a political settlement will be so much more difficult uh, because uh, 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 it has not been given the attention that it needs at an early stage. Uh, Basma, let's start with you. I, <clears throat> Look, I think the issue of, uh, of the... Uh, I'm, I'm not going to pick up everything uh, that uh, Dr. Alain Simon said. I do feel uh, in agreement with him on certain points and very uncomfortable on others. I think there is unity in fighting the regime. Any uh, specific agenda that goes in one direction or another, and if we say it's a Kurdish agenda or it's an Islamist agenda, the people on the ground reject any specific agenda at this stage you will find that uh, whether it's Muslim Brothers or it is a, a minority-based position, there are uh, sort of negative words to characterize these behaviors because nobody wants to see specific agendas implemented now. The people really want unity because they realize that without the unity, there's no way you can fight this regime, whether on the ground or politically and diplomatically on the international scene. What has prevented, I think, so far uh, the unity is uh, the lack of experience, the personal uh, rivalries, a little bit the ideological, but these are not major. The ideological is not the major issue. It is more about the organizational uh, challenge of how you put all these people together. There is no political group. Uh, Dr. Alan Simo says the National Coordination Commission. If I tell you the Damascus Declaration or the Party of the Free Syrians or you, you take any of these entities, they just come in, out in pieces uh, after you know, the first test. There are no political structures in Syria. So are we going to put thousands of individuals and say they each represent themselves? How do you represent a society when it has never been represented? 
And you suddenly need to fight a, an incredible fight on the ground, face death and destruction every single day and survive in this environment, and then tell people, go and be represented decently in an organized and structured way and agree on something. Now, even if with all these challenges, uh, there, is, there are clear documents that have been repeatedly uh, formulated by the SNC early on when it was formed, a month after it, it came together, by the late, uh, latest document on which all the efforts, the current efforts are based, is the, the docu are the documents uh, agreed in Cairo. This is 90% of the opposition that agreed on multi-party, pluralistic, diverse uh, state, democratic state, respect for, and representation and respect for all rights for all communities, specifically on the Kurdish issues. Now, all of this is stated. <coughs> what happens on the ground is a fight for survival and some groups trying to push their own agendas. And I'm sorry to say, neither an Islamist agenda nor a Kurdish agenda is welcome at this point. We, if we have a fight against the regime, you cannot say, I am, well, the, there's a proxy war going out there, going on out there. Uh, these countries are responsible for the uh, division and the sectarian divisions. And no, these countries are not responsible for the division, the sectarian division. The regime, armed and continues to try and arm minorities to fight the Muslim majority, or the, the Sunni majority. This is happening every single day on the ground. How can a society keep its immunity when massacres are committed and bodies are thrown in face of another village from the other community just to incite vengeance? So however the immunity it, it is, this is a very a deeply wounded society by a regime that has done so. This is not the nature of Syria now. With such wounds, I don't know who will heal those wounds. I don't know how we will prevent massacres. I do not know how we will prevent partition. I am extremely concerned about the future of Syria. I agree that these documents need to be implemented, but what do you implement? Do you implement a democratic, multi-sectarian? We talk across communities. There are networks of, of, uh, of trust that have developed safety networks that were developed on the ground for communities to communicate if there is uh, somebody that has been kidnapped or uh, taken by one community or another or to diffuse any tension and any vengeance. We will need a huge transitional justice uh, agenda that will framework that will need to be implemented immediately. We will need outside support. We are going to need probably a big peacekeeping force to prevent any breakaway, temptation to break away from the country. Massacres, chaos, uh, the regime trying to fight back and regain ground, all of these risks we face. And no government will be able to face those risks. Now, the opposition, based on the Cairo documents, which are very clear in committing to democratic, pluralistic principles, uh, this it <coughs> now faces the organizational challenge of developing a representative body of inside and outside and an executive body that will actually work to uh, support the population on the ground. Uh, the, the organizational challenge is considerable. The SNC has not developed the executive body that it should have, never developed it. Why? for all sorts of reasons, <coughs> but the ideological is one, one of them only. Uh, now, a, a widely supported, from inside and outside, widely supported initiative is called the National uh, Initiative, uh, National Syrian Initiative. Mm -hmm. If this comes together and has the pledge that it will be recognized as the so legitimate representative of the Syrian people, what we need now is to move one step further, uh, and that is to have a body that is legally recognized as representing Syria. The Syrian people are not represented by anyone today, neither the regime nor the, the opposition. <coughs> and therefore, we are in dire need of a partner for anything that needs to be done, whether it's humanitarian, diplomatic, political, at all levels, 
we don't have this partner at the moment. It is hopefully in the making. And if it comes about, then I think we can, we will be able to move forward. One last point about what kinds of parallel arrangements could have taken place. I think there is a specific responsibility for the majority to reassure the minorities. It falls upon the majority. It is the duty of the majority, not of the minorities. If they feel unsafe, if they feel threatened, if they feel that their rights have been um, violated or not respected, it is the responsibility of the majority to provide for that. But an agreement that is of a federal nature uh, can only be legitimate if it is concluded democratically, if it is voted by a democratic uh, entity. It is impossible today, if we, if we go for a plan that says, well, let's have federation and autonomous regions in Syria, we are going for a Dayton-like agreement, we're going for a Taif-like agreement, we are going, uh, not even Taif, we're going more for a Dayton-like uh, agreement than, than Taif, really. Uh, we have rejected, and all Syrians have rejected so far, uh, <coughs> anything that is based on sectarian uh, affiliation. It's a recipe for disaster. It has been tried in several countries. It just doesn't work. If either we have a country or we don't have a country. But uh, sectarian-based politics and uh, arrangements that, uh, that actually uh, legitimize uh, and box each community in its, uh, with a leadership that usually organizes new authoritarianism under the leadership of, a sect of the sectarian leaders. And each community is taken hostage by a leadership that then makes arrangements among themselves, and, and the whole population becomes victim of something else. So we're not getting rid of authoritarianism to fall neither under an Islamist regime that the Salafis want and, and that does not uh, fit in Syria, certainly doesn't fit in Syria, nor do we want a uh, model that says, uh, let's base it on uh, our sectarian affiliations. I don't belong to any community. I was born a Sunni Muslim from Damascus. Do I want to be uh, under the leadership of a Sunni leader who says that Sunnism tells me how I need to live every day and vote? It, it, and this is, I think, a large majority of Syrians. The politics of Syria today leave out, I would say, a good 30% who are sitting back and waiting to see what happens. They are fearful of the unknown. They don't know what comes after Bashar al-Assad. We need to reassure those. Not only do we need to reassure those, we need to mobilize those to, on our side, because this is where we will get a balanced representation of Syrians. At the moment, it's unbalanced, I agree. We, we have more of Sunnis who are opposing. We have more of uh, those who are ready to fight and those who have pulled out because they can't do it peacefully anymore and they were not ready to carry arms. Of course, we lost some of the demonstrators, a lot of those demonstrators. They came from the different communities. They were f frightened by the fight. Whether it takes a full fight to get rid of the regime, unfortunately, we are told by those who know Bashar al-Assad closely that he will only go by force. And I have asked candidly this question to many leaders. Do you really think there's a way we can finish without force? And the answer is usually no. He will only go by force. Are we going to have to fight it until the end? And that will breed perhaps more violence? Is there a point where, that we can reach where we can say he now understands it's over, and countries who have support, that have supported him say it is over, uh, and then we can have a political arrangement. I think this is the ideal scenario we would want to see, but there's no guarantee this is going to happen. So the violence obviously breeds violence, but within this very difficult context, uh, for the opposition to reach out to the, to the different communities and the Alawi community, and we try to do that, but believe me, it's not by having two Alawis on a leadership, uh, political leadership that we will resolve it. It's not that anymore. It's Alawis carrying arms against the regime that might happen. That is what is now to be expected if the Alawis are to turn against Assad. Uh, it's that harsh. Thank you. Th thank you. Thank you for this dose of realism, uh, Basma. 
let me turn to Dr. Bassam. Dr. Bassam, I want to ask you to speak slowly if you can. I'm going to ask you to speak slowly because there is interpretation here. So please talk slowly. Speak slowly. Do you agree with what has been mentioned by Dr. Bassman that the factional agendas are not acceptable, either Islamic, the uh, Kurdish, or whatever? We want a national agenda for everybody. What's your opinion in that particular matter? Actually, I say that Syrians have not been practicing politics for 40 years. Now uh, their policy, uh, there are internal politics and there are external politics. But uh, the Syrian people, with all its components, has learned uh, uh, some politics or has had uh, some deal of politics. Therefore, I think that there should be a real framework for the Syrian people to practice politics. We have been talking about the National uh, Syrian uh, Board Council in order that we can talk with the Alawites and we talk with other parties as well in order that we can achieve what we are looking for. But as I have already said, regrettably, Enough and unfortunately, the start of the National uh, Syrian uh, Council did not go the right way because there are certain uh, national uh, policies that are not going with him. There are other points of view right now that have been mentioned in the field of politics. But basically, what is the uh, ceiling uh, we are looking for. We want to topple the regime with all its regimes. If everybody is agreeing to that, there will be no problem because we'll be far from any domestic uh, procedures. Therefore, we are looking for the Syrian constitution and Syrian nationalism. Therefore, if it's going to have all the rights for all Syrians, in order that the constitution is going to guarantee for the majority and for the minority their rights as Syrian citizens. Therefore, we want to uh, uh, set uh, the draft, uh, the, uh, the, a constitution that will take care of all factions in Syria. I always listen to, to what has been said as external agendas. Of course, it's natural that there are external agendas, as the speakers have already mentioned, because there are many uh, armed groups right now inside Syria that has its allegiance for external forces. Therefore, if we have strong Polit uh, political parties in Syria, we are going to get rid of all external intervention. Shukran, Dr. Basim. Thank Dr. You, Dr. Basim. Uh, Dr. Al, uh, just conclusion. I mean, uh, I, I do, uh, in some extent, uh, agree with uh, Dr. Um, Basma, and uh, clearly this is the the, the vision. Right, that's why I'm, I'm not repeating it. This is the vision we're looking forward to have been post Assad or to build a new Syria. So the opposition now, they have arguing about a exclusive, wider representative from the ground. This was the initiative initiated by the state secretary, Hillary Clinton and by the Syrian opposition, mainly SNS, SNC. Right, the result we saw it yesterday, there was the exclusion, not exclusion. So the, they wanted to get a representative from the ground who is the, the fighting on the ground from Syria and they boycotted. They said to the people in Doha, you are not representing us. Clearly. Right. And the, the new leadership of the new executive committee of the Syrian National Council excluded a half a population of the Syrian people. 
no woman out. Half of population, yeah, 20 million, sorry, 10 million of the Syrian people, 11 million of Syrian people are excluded out of the political procedure. This is a fact. And the lady talking about exclusive and new initiative, which is include all the curse or another curse. No, the representative is there. The representative of the Syrian people are there on the ground. They are on the ground. They're fighting on the ground. You should recognize them. But they are not adopting you because you're going to stay in the hotel for five star. And these people are starving of people. And you get money from the king and they're fighting for to find a sandwich in Aleppo Street. This is a reality. Why FSA not adapt by Syrian National Council? Because these exile people, the politician who can, saying um, we are the presenting of the people, right, this is the apprentice. The model we did it, the Kurdish people have agreed and have their Kurdish Supreme Council, which represents the democratic of the old Kurdish people in Syria. Why are you not approaching them and negotiating with them. What they did in Doha is just example, the division example, because Turkey is involved, right? You don't invite Allen. Allen is against Turkey. You will invite Marwan, he's a good guy. He's a close to Saudi Arabia, yeah, we get the money. This is the reality, this is the fact I'm talking transplanting. Yeah, I'm not talking politician, lot down rap. Is a presentation there? And unfortunately, we are no leading this opposition. We needed some leader who can lead it independently. Yeah, not depending on Saudi, Qatar, Kuwait, Turkey, US, or UK, France. We, I said we can make it and we are able to do it. But in our way, in our own way. And if we needed help, we shout for help for you. If we need it. But now, what's happening now? You dominating all the procedure. I think the political settlement will be, first of all, first of all, to stop this violence by all means. By all means, that means the military means as well. We are against military intervention, but the military, the Syrian national military, the Syrian national resistance, the Syrian national resistance, they can resist. They can make a change. They can top of the asset. And this transitional government, what we call it, establishment or initiative, whatever we call it, should include all the opposition. This is our view. We get somewhere, the opposition of Syria get it together without excluding anyone, even me, even any child, any woman, any youth. Maybe we get 2,000 representatives, and then we'll be elective up to 20 people, from 2,000 to 20 people. This was not happened in Doha. Kurd wasn't there, officially. Another ethnic minority was there not. The people who's fighting and uh, uh, sacrificing their blood against this brutal regime, they were not there represented, if I say, right? So if this establishment happened, this transitional power happened, and we then, after this transition, this can prepare for a democratic, pluralistic, uh, a new Syrian, and based on the constitution, the democratic constitution, not the Syrian Arab Republic, not the president has to be the eight, the panel, the panel code in Syria, eight number, yeah, has the, the president has to be Syri uh, uh, Arab Muslim. So when I'm Syrian, I cannot be president in now today's constitution because I'm a Kurd. So it has to be Arab and Muslim and none are Syrian, Syriac or Christian. This is the panel of the uh, code panel of the Syrian constitution, number eight, right? So this is the, the, once we get it together, this transitional uh, period, they can prepare for democratic constitution and 
we do need a compromise of the international communities, of the UN, uh, UN Resolution for Security Resolution, and all the involved, regional and international. They get the compromise. This is the two pact, right? And I think is starting now after this, seeing this failing of the opposition, the international community, yeah, is starting getting, approaching each other. They're talking to Russia today and they're getting some compromise. Once they're getting some com com compromise and the Syrian people are ready, right? When they're getting that one, so they have to have a referendum. We are, I am, yeah, I'm representing one party of 20 Kurdish party, right? I'm one of 20. I'm not saying I'm old. Right. This is the democratic representation. And this is why I'm saying the people in Syria, the Syrian people, after this period of transitional uh, constitution, preparing for the constitution, will be a referendum. How the Syrian people won't run themselves. Not by me, not by Dr. Marwan, not by Basma. How they want to run themselves. We have a say. We have to ask them for a referendum. How you would like to have the constitution, the Syrian constitution. This is the Syrian people can decide. This is the Syrian people fate. And we should, everyone, respect it. This is what we're looking for. If Syrian people wanted to have a separate state, they have a separate state, independent state, independent state. And based on a transparent, a free referendum with a free election. If they want to, uh, to elect a Muslim, a Muslim, a jihadist, we should respect it because this is election. But our duty is we have to put it right to the people, explain it, clarify it, why it's not good having a jihadist president or have a Kurdish president. I'm not uh, specifying for, for this one. A people have a word, have a say, and this is the democracy we're looking for and we're struggling for. This is our model for democracy and we wanted to, uh, all the Syrian people, not just the Syrian people, all the regional and i think this the principle of democracy is going to contribute to the syria regional and for democracy and stabilization in the region thank you thank you doctor so uh, let's give half an hour to questions we're going to go overboard uh, i'll take three questions at a time uh, please state your name and affiliation and as i said please be sure to be uh, lots of people already, Ziad. Please. Uh. Thank you. Thank you, Marwan. Welcome to Washington, the three of you. Now that you are in Washington, we have a new president, and uh, the three of you have an opportunity to give a message to the president, the American people. What is it that you want, you advise the American policy to be at this point in time? Uh, I have a quick comment and a question. First of all, Syria is a civilization that has lasted for more than 3,000 years and has never shown in the recent history to be sectarian or uh, violent. It was actually accommodating to a lot of minorities that migrated to Syria. The Kurdish came to Syria, the Armenians came to Syria, and multiple other uh, minorities came to Syria and stayed there. The problem started 40 years ago with that dictatorship that uh, bred sectarianism in the society. So uh, after that regime is removed, we expect the society to go back to the previous situation. We don't expect it to go in a sectarian violence situation. And the proof for that is we have never heard that the FSA have attacked any Alawite village and con conducted a massacre in retaliation for the massacres being done every day on the ground in the other in all the cities of Syria. The second point is uh, there are two aspects of the uh, problem in Syria. One is political, 
and the other is what's on the ground, a humanitarian situation that exceeds any description. It's a catastrophe of about 20 million people or 18 million people being in need of help. What did the international community do to stop that humanitarian catastrophe and prevent any intervention from outside if the people of Syria do so not have question, any other that's question, the question. Please. That's the first yes. question to Sister Basma, and I have a question for uh, Dr. Allen. And the, uh, the, the question is, what did the international community do to help that human, humanitarian catastrophe and stop any outside intervention from happening if they don't like that intervention? And what do the people of Syria have if they don't have any other alternative? The question to Dr. Allen is uh, did the regime in Syria try to work people against each other, withdraw from some uh, Kurdish areas, and give them some uh, ability to do whatever they want in order to put them against the rest of the communities? And for example, what happened in Azaz next to Aleppo, which is a Kurdish town, when they resisted the regime? Can you tell me that you can do democracy in Azaz as you did in Kamishli? Please, uh, these are the two questions that I have. There's a woman in the back there. Uh, yes, please. Yes, yes. Near Tom, yes. Hi, Kim Ghattas from the BBC. Um, I know my question may sound harsh. I know that the situation is very difficult in Syria, both for the people on the ground and for the opposition abroad as well. But I, I, I struggle to understand a little bit when you say that you know, inexperience is one of the reasons that the Syrian opposition hasn't managed to uh, galvanize international support or make good progress. And we just heard as well, um, you know, Syria hasn't had a real political life for, for decades. I know it's very difficult to compare countries, but the Libyans certainly managed to get their act together when it comes to the opposition and galvanize international support in a very successful way. And I know Syria quite well. There is a real tradition there of civil society, even though it has been uh, impeded by the regime. So I, I really struggle to understand why inexperience is one of the reasons why the Syrian opposition can't seem to make good progress. That's correct. All right. Best may you want to take the first shot? And I, 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 I hope you can limit your questions, sure. uh, your okay. answers uh, uh, in time, because w there are lots of people who are, want to ask questions. OK. Mm. Let me take the last one and come to the first, uh, the end. Why not, uh, the, why not unity such as in Libya? Look, I don't think you can bring people around, uh, of coming from different uh, backgrounds, ideological, cultural, different regions, and so on, to unite around an objective that is impossible to reach. Unlike Libya, we have no accessible objective. The international community decided to take the 10, 12 uh, Libyans that emerged as the opposition and to say, here is the council, here are the people who are asking for intervention, we're going for it. When you have a common objective, people rally around it. The common objective that we have is the overthrow of this regime. But where is the plan? There is no uh, agreement outside Syria to help the Syrians reach what they need to reach. It takes much longer, it is much more difficult, and therefore you will uh, obviously see uh, divisions about why are we failing, why is it not succeeding, uh, who should we blame, do we blame ourselves, do we blame each other? I think these are very important reasons for the difference between Libya and, and, and Syria. And if we don't have, if, to, if today we say, here is what is going to happen with the support of the international community. I am not afraid to say, and this does not delegitimize the Syrian revolution, that we need the international support, humanitarian and otherwise. We are fighting a war that is not against just the regime. We are fighting a war that other countries are fighting on the side of the regime, and unfortunately, we need to go further than simply say we will rely on our own forces. This is what is happening so far, but the cost is much too high and cannot be sustained without considerable damage uh, on the, over the, the, the long term. Uh, the second question about what is the international community doing, I think it's not doing what it needs to do. Uh, and on the humanitarian in particular, there is no, not enough trust in Syrian local channels. 
if international uh, organizations are unable to come into Syria, they are saying we are uh, powerless. We are in, uh, incapable of going into the region. The ICRC just stated that yesterday, saying we cannot respond to the needs on the ground. Well, look for Syrian channels to do so. And, and as the lady mentioned, there is a civil society, there are channels that can be used, we are using them, they're very difficult because it's very difficult to channel aid, but uh, this has not been attempted by the international community. Instead, each country says, uh, we're relying on our own NGO, or we will go to a UN an organization, and the UN organization itself cannot reach the people. So uh, trust the Syrian people and use local channels is, is really the message. Uh, to Obama, tr do, I think, everything that the United States uh, is capable of doing. <laughs> That's right. Dr. Simon. Uh, yeah, I've started from then, and yeah, uh, and this is a crucial um, US uh, foreign policy uh, toward the Middle East, and especially after this what's it called Arab uprising is a very crucial. So within one week, they get um, Mubarak to leave. And if they want it, and they cooperated really for demand, legitimate demand of the Syrian people, they could, they could, as I said, leave it, yeah, for one week, maybe two months, they could force him to leave. Yeah. And uh, Unfortunately, this is the right question about the military and humanitarian military aid and uh, the, the percentage of the, the BBC report of the uh, disputing of the uh, humanitarian aid. Unfortunately, uh, the comparison, the Libyan people has elected, I don't agree with Basma, they have elected their representative, council, Transitional Council, Transitional Government. But our is not elected. They talking on behalf of Saudi Arab, Qatar, Turkey. They're not talking on behalf of the Syrian people. Therefore, it's a very difficult and complex. Who you give to weapon? Who you give military, medicine? I'm a medical professional. To send it to who? And now they are deep concern that the humanitarian help is going to the regime hands. As have been some report about it. Yeah? So, therefore, I think it's very complex, that complex, because the Syrian opposition is not speaking on behalf of the Syrian demand people, legitimate demand. And therefore, it's difficult now, I do agree, we have no representative. And the model I'm talking about, Azaz, this is what we did. Azaz, which is, yeah, very close down border to, to the Kurdish Afrin and in other areas. We have been working with local commander of FSA. We have a respect and cooperative. Right, as I mentioned, this area is, Safe haven for the civil people who's fleeing the violence. Lest the children, the women stay in this area, we protect them. Every single Kurdish family have a four Arab family in our house. This is that we're proud to say we are united people. We share our sacrifice and we share our fight. We did. And now, because some is not organized, we don't know FSA. Today is one commander. Next day, you say, is another one. One is getting money from Saudi, so do whatever Saudi tell him to do. The another one is friendly to Turkey. Whatever Turkey they do, it's like you cannot negotiate, have a, a central committee agreement with them to approach them and to integrate with them. And this was, was the Ashrafiya incident last week, the provoke, right, and get, yeah, attempt to have a control of the civil, relatively uh, peaceful, established Kurds there, then protecting them, we have told the FSA Kurds, look, 
we're protecting our area, we're helping you, we can, yeah, starting from this point, right, because you are targeted by the regime, wherever you go, they will bombing you, and this is civilian people. This is not military people. They provoke and they admit it, say, oh, we shouldn't do it, this one, and we should respect it, right? And the FSA shouldn't go to the Kurdish area and provoke the Kurds, say, okay, we take the control, because they went in, and next four hours they announced, oh, we took control all over Aleppo, and Ashrafia is under control of the FSA. And this is a provocation of the, yeah, all the regional Turkish, and to provoke the relatively, relatively peace, uh, relatively peaceful establishment, you know, the area, the neighborhood in Kamish, uh, in Ashrafia and Sheikh Maksud, if you know, the Alep, Aleppo people. And this Ashrafia and Sheikh Maksud now is the, the safe haven. Let's start it from there. Let's help it. This way we told it. This way we're negotiating with FSA now. So look, here you are, and we're going to help you. We help them. We saved eight of them when the regime was in Bustan Pasha, right? When they bombed them, the regime, we get them in through the Kurdish area and get them safe. And this, this, this is the way we should cooperate and work together. And this is the, 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 the way forward, so it's not the, the, the conflict, no. So we started from Ashrafia, and, and we get to another area, another, another area. But we, have, we, we needed a, a central organized committee. Yeah. Oh, the okay. Kurdish party have, right, this way I'm giving you example. Can I, can yeah, I, can just I, example, just example. we really are running out of time. Just example, the Kurdish party saying, I mean, they have elected their representative. Why you don't approach them and talk to them? Why are you talking to me? Because I'm friendly to you? I said this is a legitimate elected body. So you talk to them. And this is a clear message for the opposition, for the regime, for everyone getting involved. The curse has been elected their representative and they can representative, represent the Kurdish cause. And please, please approach them for any concern regarding the curse. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Dr. Basim, I would like to ask you a question. In this way, we will not be able to خلنا نأخذ الأسئلة لأن حقيقة ما ضل إلا ربع ساعة. تفضل دكتور باسم. دكتور باسم، please go ahead but try to be short in order that we can give opportunity for others. I'm talking about the Syrian people who was expecting the U.S. elections and they were waiting for. Obama, who has already succeeded, I hope, that he's going to take a decisive decision to sever the diplomatic relations with Syria and give them logistic and military uh, assistance in a timely manner, and then they can provide them with services for the civil societies that can take care of all the assistance that's going to be received by them in a right manner. Thank you. Uh, hi, my name is Hayim Gaddar. I'm a public policy scholar with the Wilson Institute and also managing editor of Now Lebanon in Beirut. Uh, my question is uh, for uh, Mr. Bassam. Uh, I'm going to ask in Arabic. Um, the civil uh, government, we have heard so much about the civil government, but there is no specific dimensions of this. The Muslim brothers in Istanbul have been talking about the civil society, but when they talk about the civil society, this means non-military. So I'd like to know 
do you think that the secular uh, uh, government should be the thing that we are looking for, not only uh, civil uh, My uh, other questions for uh, Basman Khadmani, uh, uh, Hezbollah is obviously uh, very much involved uh, in uh, Syria on the ground, boots on the ground with the regime, uh, and cracking down on the opposition and killing uh, people. Uh, how do you think this is will reflect on Lebanon, and especially the Shia in Lebanon? We see the tension between the uh, Sunni Shia in Lebanon very much so, and how this is going to evolve in your opinion? Gentleman over here. Thank you very much. Munzer Sleiman with Al Mayadeen TV. Uh, all this discussion, there was no mentioning of Lakhdar al Ibrahimi. <laughs> and we're talking about political solution in Syria. Uh, the reality on the ground that the Syrian people and the entire people of the Arab world and the rest of the world wants the bloodshed to stop. You compare with Libya and other places, the reality after 20 months that the regime has some base of support and have the military, most of the military, with them. So any political solution must take into consideration some sort of intermediary uh, period, like if you reject Taif, if you reject Dayton kind, then you're looking for the ultimate solution that probably will never arrive if when Syria still exists and the people still exist in Syria. Isn't there is some sort of compromise need to be produced? How you can be for Syrian people and not looking for that compromise? Wait, if you can wait for the microphone. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Masher. Farah Atasi. Uh, I would like to ask Mr. Allen, you know, you were, uh, I'm sorry I came a little bit late, but you were talking about the uh, assistance. Uh, I think the, uh, first of all, the Kurdish element inside the SNC, and I'm def not defending the SNC here, but uh, the Kurdish uh, uh, groups who joined the SNC elected uh, their representatives at the SNC, and the president of the SNC is Kurdish, uh, Dr. Abdel Basit Sida, and you're talking about the support of Saudi and Qataris and other regional powers to, to the resistance to the Syrian freedom fighters uh, and uh, uh, the Kurdish uh, part you want to call it even though we see it's it's all Syrian you are, you are Syrian first and, and this is the identity of every Syrian who's joining the revolution but you are also getting the assistance from Mr. Barazani and from the uh, Kurdistan of Iraq so it is uh, fair if you are getting that assistance and the regime is getting the assistance from Iran and from Russia and from China so it's fair for the resistance and the freedom fighters to ask for help. I think, uh, first of all, I would like to welcome Dr. Qudmani in town. We, we wanted her to be a long time uh, ago here. I think now we're talking about Obama uh, and the new administration. I think we as a Syrian can do a lot to change the current uh, uh, situation or, or the position of the U.S. government that they took before the election. I, I think the administration before the election and now after the election, they should take another stance in really working hard and take back the leadership role and not leaving that vacuum that the Iranian and the uh, uh, other powers are, are taking control of the Syrian uh, 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 revolution, destiny and, and, and fate, whereas the United States took uh, a step back. We want the United States to come forward and take back the leadership by supporting the Syrian freedom fight by supporting the initiative of uh, Mr. Riyad Saif and not claiming the credit of that initiative. I was with Dr. Riyad Saif and Dr. Basma and that initiative was on the table a long time ago, several months ago. So many other national leaders uh, uh, inside, uh, um, you know, within the revolution, they 
uh, gave the, uh, it's not only Dr. Mr. Riyadh Safe Initiative. A lot of Syrian leaders agree on the principle that it is time to have a unified political body that represent the Syrian revolution away from all these differences. And I think it is a good chance for the Syrians now in Doha to unify against this initiative and take uh, advantage of it. And I don't think the United States should take a credit or any other power showing that, hey, we want this. It is a Syrian national initiative, and we should stress the identity of this initiative. And I hope it will work. Thank you. Question from the back. I don't see a people from the back. Yes, sir. Mm. Yes, my name is Greg Aftandilian with the Center for National Policy. My question deals with the Alawite community. It seems that if the uh, Assad regime is going to fall, the Alawites themselves have to say to themselves, you know, this, this guy has taken us down a very dangerous road and we have to break away from him. But it seems that they would only do that if they can be assured that, that there won't be any bloodletting after the fall of the Assad regime. So what assurances can the opposition give to the Alawite community that there wouldn't be this type of revenge attacks? Thank you. One more question. Yes, please. Thank you. Tamara Rifai from Human Rights Watch. And my question is for the three panelists, because you've all touched upon the increased level of violence, and uh, we all have reports about a more sectarian nature of the violence. You've touched a bit about um, mechanisms that should be put in place, including justice, but you have touched very little on the concept of accountability in view of the impunity that is reigning now in Syria from all parts, really, because we've seen violations from all parties, and this is not a comparison. Um, are, is this at the center of your thinking for a transition into um, a Syria where the wounds could heal, like Dr. Kudmani is saying? Because for Human Rights Watch, this is at the center of the thinking of how you can bring justice and how you might be able to deter some of the atrocities happening now if people knew they would be held accountable. Thank you. Thank you. I will give each panelist strictly three minutes, and then we, we're already 15 minutes uh, above, uh, beyond, beyond the scheduled time. So, Basma. Uh, difficult to answer seriously <laughs> any of these issues. Uh, look, I think the uh, stability for Lebanon uh, and return to normal life is dependent on, what ha on how things end in Syria. I would say we have a non-management of the Syrian crisis so far and an accumulation of mistakes and missed opportunities and neglect. And, uh, you know, that can lead to the, uh, to the worst disasters in history. I mean, World War I could have been prevented if uh, three or four good diplomats had just diffused the tension that was building and avoid the, the aggressive ones who were pushing for it. And the result is uh, the millions of dead. We can go to the worst with this if it's not managed. The Syrian crisis has not been managed so far. The dynamics inside, the negative dynamics, the dangerous dynamics, are just developing, unraveling without any uh, mitigation, I would say, by any uh, in serious initiative from outside. The Lakhdar Ibrahimi's role, based on uh, what he can do to bring about a political settlement. Uh, he is back to discussing and defending the Geneva document. It is not a resolution, it is only a document, and the Russians have said once more to Mr. Brahimi three days ago, we will not accept that this become a resolution under chapter seven. They are not so far really serious about this document. So. If it was to be taken seriously, it should become a resolution of the UN Security Council and be a basis for a political settlement. Instead, we have not seen that happen. So I don't think we can really discuss it seriously as the basis. This being said, I think reassuring communities in Syria, whether they are Alawites or others, is absolutely key. And doing that is not easy when you are faced with a strategy of constant attempts to tear apart the social fabric 
uh, and the political fabric of the country, but mainly the social fabric. If you want to reassure Alawites while uh, they are committing, the, while the regime has mobilized militias based not only on Alawites, these are Alawites and Sunnis. Uh, the uh, militias of the Shabiha in Syria, unfortunately are, or fortunately are mixed, completely mixed. So we can't say these are only Alawites, but they are definitely very afraid. What we can, what can be done is, uh, yes, it is including in documents. Yes, it's including them in the political uh, opposition, but it's also now developing plans for protecting the sensitive areas in the country to prevent any massacres. Because I think, it, it, it one percent of determined people in the country can jeopardize what 99 percent want for the country by one or two massacres and we will be faced with uh, outrage and fear and so on uh, one last point i think if we are reassuring uh, if we are reassuring communities uh, we should also reassure political groups there is a big section of syrians who are affiliated uh, willingly or, uh, or uh, out of need to the Ba'ath party. But there are also some Ba'athists who believe genuinely that there was a modern progressive ideology for this country and it turned and it was deviated from. This is their beliefs. Whether we uh, agree, we this is political differences. So this is perfectly legitimate. These people need to be reassured. And some of them are Alawites. Some are Christian and some are Sunnis. But those Alawites very often, I often say that, they believe they want to be Ba'athists. They don't want to be reassured as Alawis. They want to be reassured as having been Ba'athist. And that this is not a, a, a shame to have been a Ba'athist or a crime. Uh, therefore, when, when we look at the silent communities in Syria, we also need to look at them as employees of the public sector, Ba'athists, uh, private um, um, businessmen, who also, a, 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 a prominent Alawi businessman is a businessman doesn't care so much about being reassured as a Alawi. He wants to be reassured about his interests. And he comes and negotiates his interests with the opposition. So we should be also aware that don't look at our societies as just a collection of, of communities. We also have these social and economic interests that can sometimes be more important. Thank you. Thank you so much. Dr. Basim. I'd like to also define the uh, civil uh, state as a, a state that has all uh, legitimate rights of citizenship, political, economic rights, as well as social, and uh, a state that has uh, civil societies uh, where a citizen feels full freedoms, uh, not as a minority, but he'll be within a framework of the civil society system. This is the uh, state that what we aspire for. You'd like to call it a secular state. We would like to call it a civil the constitutional state also. Uh, so I, I, as to the Alawites, I would say that the main uh, uh, issue with the uh, Alawite community. There are a, a, a large number of them that uh, support the regime, uh, whether they serve in the government or in uh, the military, or they support them financially or by relations. Uh, they very clearly, any de deviation, any person who will uh, 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 split from this uh, regime uh, are very welcome. Uh, uh, so uh, recently, uh, one Alawite uh, female uh, officer uh, uh, had uh, dissented, and now she is part of the uh, opposition. So thank you. Thank you for uh, your uh, brief remarks. Dr. Thank you. Um, I would uh, rather give my time to the audience because I like, I love your comments, I love your uh, question. Uh, I'll just take 30 seconds, nothing, and the rest will for you. Uh, I do agree with the lady, right? If the Kurds, as one of the question or comment, uh, considering Kurds as a migrant, yeah, same as a migrant living in a Galeon statement as well. And this, yeah, if they are immigrant, if they are immigrant, and uh, they are happily to be supported and go back to the origin. 
which is Kurdistan. But they're not coming, they're immigrants in Damascus, but they're not immigrants in Kamishli, are they? they right. So, right, sorry, you said your comment, I'm, I'm just answering, yeah? This is the question. Right, they will, they are, ha sorry. Please, go. I mean, I'm, I'm asking this gentleman said is immigrant. Galyun said as well, same as immigrant as in France, uh, Algerian and Morocco in France. So this is statement of NSC officially was cleared. So the political statement, I do agree. And I mentioned gentlemen about uh, Al Akdar Brahimi. They, I said we missed that appointment, that six point peace plan. We were talking about war. This is the peace plan, and we missed that one. And now they realized. They missed that opportunity and then trying to go to that opportunity via Geneva. Yeah, recommendation or advisory document, I would say it, but we consider the Geneva uh, and we want it to, to be a resolution, a UN resolution, despite Russian protests from Russian or another people, because it's a comprehensive and a democratic, fair representative of the Syrian people. Thank you. Thank you. Before we end, let me just remind you of uh, the way forward. We're going to take a 15-minute break for coffee. Then we'll uh, have a session on the socio-economic challenges facing Syria, both now and in a post-Assad regime. At lunch, we have uh, the Deputy Assistant Secretary of State, Liz Dibble, give us the U.S. view. And we're still trying to get Ahmad Ramadan, who is probably being elected now in, in Doha, but we're still trying to get him via VC uh, to hear their views. And then the afternoon session will be on political Islam and uh, what is going on also the rise of jihadist uh, groups in Syria, etc. So uh, with that, please join me in thanking the panelists for an excellent session. And